Hi, welcome back to the channel. This is a live free training seminar looking at the topic of managing conflict between staff. My name is Simon Good. I'm a professional mediator and I do conflict resolution training predominantly with organizations. I've decided to start this YouTube channel as a way to provide some of the same resources that I often talk about with staff when I'm running workshops for free on this channel. Just double checking that the audio is working okay. Sorry about that in the background. I'm still sort of figuring out the technology, so I'll just do a quick test and then we can get started. Um, I'm sort of made a commitment to do this over the next few weeks pretty much daily. So if there's a particular topic that you'd like me to discuss in one of these episodes, a challenging person that you've got to deal with at your work or a difficult situation that your team is grappling with either at the moment or something that keeps coming up, uh, please let me know. I'd be more than happy to make a specific video like this looking at your, your specific challenges. So today we're looking at this topic of managing conflict between staff, the key things that you'll take away. I'll talk through some conflict assessment tools, so uh, sort of different options that you can use to figure out what's going on in a particular conflict situation, particularly if you're a manager or a business owner or you're in a leadership role. I'll talk about some of the factors that are often involved. I'll explain basically the five different kinds of conflict and then how we can take a strategic approach to each of these. And what we're aiming for is to develop a holistic and strategic plan for dealing with conflict. I often say what we want to do is to avoid reacting and figure out a way to strategically respond. Now, I should say that although all of these different ideas that I'll talk about in the session today, to some extent sound simple, it's difficult to know how to apply them. And so what I'll do is look at a specific uh, case study. I'll just pull that up now. So I thought this might be helpful just to look at a, a specific example of, of workplace conflict. It's actually based on a mediation I did a little while ago. And this is what's called matrix management, where within an organization, staff report to two different people, like one person for a clinical type of stuff, like me as a mediator. I might have a senior mediator who checks how I'm interacting with clients and how I'm running my sessions. But I also might have an operations manager or logistics or something like that. Often we have different parts of our role broken into the diff different sets of KPIs and responsibilities, which is what's going on here. I thought this could be helpful because maybe you've got a similar kind of issue that you've dealt with, but it, even if you're dealing with a conflict that's a little bit different, you'll see the way that I go about analyzing this situation and the different lenses that I use, which hopefully will be helpful for you and it can be translated across to different contexts and different situations. So we've got a, a community support organization jointly led by a clinical supervisor as well as an ops manager. This is that matrix management type of thing that I talked about where, you know, you've got your clinical, say you're a caseworker or a family domestic violence worker or homelessness or something. Someone will talk to you about your practice, like the language that you use and how you're interacting with clients. And then you might also have an ops manager. Each of these people report separately to the board and they have different areas of responsibility. So it sounds like different sets of KPIs, different things that they're measured against, and they would have different areas they're responsible for in their job descriptions. Their team report to them both to, I should say, the, the, um, the clinical supervisor for practice issues and to the manager for administrative issues. The manager has been in the organization for over 10 years and the clinical supervisor began six months ago. They've recently been a number of managers start and then leave within 12 months. So we can start to see there might be a little bit of a pattern here. The people that are in that ops manager role keep starting and then leaving and the, clini the uh, clinical supervisor on the other hand has been there for quite a long time. The current manager has lodged a formal complaint against the clinical supervisor, describing them as impossible to work with and overbearing. The supervisor describes the new manager as incompetent and completely lacking in the ability to manage the center. And as such, they have also lodged formal complaints. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation like this. A lot of the mediations I do, I come in and both sides have literally lodged complaints against each other. So it's sort of like, well, how do we do an investigation here? <laughs> because literally everybody is the victim and everybody is the perpetrator if we take things at face value. I suppose the funny thing is, is that in some sense that could be correct, at least from their own perspectives and how they've experienced the situation. They probably do feel like things have been stacked against them and that they've been unfairly victimized and treated or singled out or whatever else it might be. 
and they've probably experienced most of the negative side of the other person and they would also have a black and white perspective in the way that they see them. They're all bad, they're against me, they're out to get me, this type of thing. Whereas in reality, there's probably a lot more nuance. They might be out to get you to some extent, but they'll also have other things that they're aiming for, like rising in their career or minimizing stress or minimizing work or who knows what. So it's almost like we tend to exaggerate our importance in other people's eyes, I think. And in these types of situations, as you get more and more stressed, what tends to happen is that you interpret common types of situations as being more threatening than they normally would be. A sense of pressure starts to rise and you become more and more reactive and irritable. Um, you almost develop tunnel vision. You lose sight of the details. You, again, you tend to paint the other person as all good or all bad or against me. So you read into that when they say something to you, you pick up on that little tone of voice that shows that they're slightly annoyed. And then you say something like, what's your problem? And then before you know it, you're in an argument. And there would have been an opportunity to avoid that. And to be honest, if you're in a more positive frame of mind, you might not have even picked up on that same negative input that the other person was giving you. So the classic matrix management type of dilemma. Now, as you go about engaging with both of the people that are involved in this situation, it would be really important to apply the de-escalation framework that I often talk about in my training. This is stuff like body language, being really calm and composed, the tone of voice, low tone, slower speed, lower volume, setting up the context, like the meeting room, for example, don't stand too far apart, sit if you're able to. I'll put that on the screen if you want to take a screenshot. And if that's helpful for you, I'd be happy to prepare another like a 30 minute training seminar just looking at de-escalation skills if you'd like. Uh, please let me know if, you, if you'd be willing to comment below and, and if you'd be willing to press like on this video, by the way, it makes a massive um, difference for a brand new channel like this for the algorithm. If one person thinks that it's good, you will actually help me. So thank you in advance if you're prepared to do that. So I mentioned earlier, I often talk about conflict and breaking it apart into these different types. And I particularly like this model, looking at the five main factors that are contributing to conflict. We've got relationship conflict, data conflict, interest conflict, values, and structure. And in a lot of conflict situations that you're dealing with at work, there's probably a number of these factors that are contributing. I will briefly explain what they look like and then we can look at that situation involving the manager and the clinical supervisor and which factors might be going on. And what I'm aiming to do is to show you then how we can take this analysis and use it to develop a plan for managing a situation that we're dealing with. Relationship conflict is the first type of conflict, although that often comes about, it's almost like the tip of the iceberg. You might notice that there's data conflict going on, like they've got different ideas around something that was agreed to, and then relationship conflict might come about as a result. They become irritable with each other and short and interrupting or whatever. I'd probably leave off dealing with the relationship conflict until you fix the data stuff, taking everyone out for a drink, doing some team building activity, having lunch, that's not going to solve the problem if there's one of those other four types of conflict going on. So let's have a look at each of those in turn and, and what they involve and what they might include as examples. So relationship conflict, it's often stuff that develops through patterns of the way that two people or two parties are communicating. You can have relationship conflict between two organizations or a client and an organization as well, but it's particularly common in my experience in interactions between staff. And you just get annoyed at each other. As a result, tension might start to build up a sense of resentment, like people feel like they're being treated differently by the other person, singled out, they're being overly harsh, overly dramatic, overly unreasonable, overly entitled, whatever it is. It might be from something like entitlement or dependency. A lot of managers and leaders, and I know for me, it, it really pushed my buttons when someone was really entitled and they expected to be spoon fed everything and they became dependent on me almost to tell them what to do. And I just, wouldn't <laughs> especially early in my career I just said look you know you're being paid a good wage go and do your job uh, I'll let you know if you're not doing the right thing almost like taking this punitive type of approach what I've learned since then is that of course a coaching type of leadership often gets far better results from staff if we can empower them and build their self-efficacy and help them to develop a level of awareness and responsibility it goes such a long way to solving conflict type of problems but yeah earlier on I would find resentment was really building up for people who weren't pulling their weight, for people who weren't willing to give it a go before coming to me to help for help. 
But it could be things like people feel like they're getting their an unfair share of work or something like that. It might even be resentment about something that's happening outside of work. I know a lot of organizations these days are challenged with like Facebook or Instagram or whatever, TikTok communication that happens outside of the office, like people commenting on each other's pages. And this is the kind of thing that really very quickly builds resentment if there's misunderstanding that occurs there or someone does not like someone that they work with and they want to have a go at them. Blame, irritability, you might at the pointy end start to see people just refusing to communicate with each other, refusing even to say hello or good morning. And that what what uh, Dr. Bramson often talks about, a reciprocal negative spiral pattern. I'll try and remember to put the Dr. Robert Bramson's notes in the... He's written a book around sort of recovering from this negative spiral pattern. And the way that this plays out is that I might come in and say good morning to you and you've got AirPods in, but I don't hear you. And so I think, well, what's your problem? You can't even say good morning to me now. Is that what it's come to? And so then when I see you in the lunchroom later, I you know, give you the cold shoulder and give you the silent treatment. And then you're thinking, well, what's Simon's problem? And so you can sort of see how these relationships often go down the gurgler like this. It happens a lot in couple relationships, miscommunication, misunderstandings. And the most common one, I think, is criticism like accidentally communicating in a way that comes across as criticism and of course that tends to trigger defensiveness and resistance as a result it might be things that you might you may not be aware of like asking someone why did you do that for example that often comes across as quite critical or asking are you sure you're okay have you got it have you got it have you got it yes i've got it like stop asking me that type of thing might be interpreted as criticism so I think that's one of the, the common mistakes that people often make, which contributes to that negative spiral pattern. But the other one is assuming that the other person's reaction is all about you. Of course, it's not. People might be upset about things that are completely not to do with us and that we might not be aware of at all. And the fact that they're grumpy and irritable and reactive with us doesn't necessarily mean that we've done anything wrong. It therefore doesn't necessarily mean that we should do anything differently in dealing with them. What they might need in the short term is just space. So when we look at relationship conflict, space is often something that's a really good remedy for this. Just take a time out, sleep on it. You'd be surprised at how much calmer and more composed you'd be after you've had lunch and put some food in your stomach so you don't have that low blood sugar and your body's crying out like, this sucks, this is dangerous, this, this is a panic, we need to get out of here. And maybe the meeting wasn't actually that contentious, it was just that everybody was super tired and stressed just because they were in a really uncomfortably hot room. So if we're looking for options for responding for relationship conflict, I often say that just at least in the short term, just tolerate what you can. If you've got staff who don't like each other, maybe in some situations that's something that you can live with for now. As long as they're doing their job and they find some way to communicate about the things that they need to, that might be something that, although it's not ideal and of course you'd like it to be different, maybe it's something that you can accept for now. I also suggest discussing patterns with people, like talk to them about how this has developed. You could ask questions like, um, has it always been this way between the two of you? It seems like earlier on things were more positive. What, what did you notice in terms of things starting to go backwards or becoming more negative over time? We're sort of wanting to help them to identify other factors that might be contributing, like change within the organization or other people coming and going or the pressure of their role, or maybe it's some of the nuances in the challenge of the way that they have to work together. And this is just very uncomfortable, stressful work. And so it's natural that people will become snappy at different times. And as you sort of start to help them to explore that and realize, oh, this is a pattern that's going on, not just with us, but other people too, or it's not just in this context, it's others as well. What often happens is that they start to develop ideas about ways to deal with it. It's a really effective way of helping someone developing the awareness is asking the right questions. We want to empathize. You know, that sounds like a really tough spot to be. That sounds really frustrating. It sounds like you're really trying to make things work. And at the, at the moment, you're not getting the kind of response that you're hoping for from the other person. Clarify expectations. If you're just saying to them, look, guys, this isn't going to work with the two of you not saying hello in the morning. I need you to both to at least say hello. And what I'm looking for is professional communication only about work matters. You don't have to be friends. You don't have to be mates. Like, I'm, I'm perfectly happy if you'd like to just leave each other alone most of the time. But on these particular issues, this is the kind of communication that needs to happen between the two of you. Is that something that you can manage? 
it's very clearly, this is what I want you to do. This is what I'm tolerating. This is what I'm not. This is when, this is a time frame of when I expect this to be different or when I expect something to be done. In that way, we're establishing that level of accountability because somebody can't say, you didn't tell me that. That's not something that was made clear to me. And establishing boundaries, is there any limit on this? Like maybe one person prefers the other one not to come into their office, to email them if they want to meet. So that's an example of you can just solve some of that constant pushing each other's buttons if you can just clarify what they're going to do towards each other and the way that they'll treat each other. Data conflict is the next kind of conflict. This is often to do with information. It might be informal type of stuff, like you said you were going to do that. No, I didn't. Or it might be the contract and an ambiguous clause or a clause that people are interpreting differently. It might be something that wasn't covered and you've come across a situation that you didn't expect. So some examples there, misunderstandings, maybe a lack of information, maybe one of the staff are doing something in their role and they assume that it's correct, but actually when you go back and look at the job description, that's not actually what it says. So that would be an example of data conflict. The person thought that they were right, but in fact they were doing the wrong thing according to the job description. It might be forgetting. I often say, you know, it sounds like the two of you aren't clear about expectations. And they, one party says, no, no, we're very clear. It's sort of selective amnesia that the other person's using. Maybe. I mean, if we talk about it and clarify it and put it on the record to some extent, put it in an email, we increase the chance of them not being able to get away with that tactic moving forward. And it might be that something just has different interpretations. So if we're dealing with data conflict, the options for responding often are to acknowledge and normalize the conflict, to clarify data and to clarify the expectations moving forward. So let's go back to the um, case study. So what are some examples here of relationship conflict? Well, the fact that they are refusing to speak to each other and that communication has been going downhill, the formal complaints and that level of, I guess, frustration that might be there. There's obviously some type of relationship conflict, but this is the classic example of where I would leave this until last. Data conflict here could be something like um, you know, there's the overlap in the manager and the clinical supervisor's responsibility. So how are they going to manage that? Let's say the operations manager wants to talk about caseload. The clinical supervisor might have concerns that that would impact on the time that each staff member can spend on each case. And so what's really helpful there in terms of the data conflict is to clarify how are they going to manage these kind of situations moving forward? Again, this is shifting the focus. You don't need to be friends. You don't need to like each other. It's perfectly fine if you've got different ideas or perspectives, but how are you going to manage it if that's a situation that you come across? Because looking at the past experience, it probably will be. So we work together as a group, or I could just tell them what to do, depending on how directive I decide to be. But these, this is how I expect you to act in these types of situations. In that way, we should avoid some of the data conflict, I guess, that might be contributing to this situation from going on. So I'll flick back to the next type of conflict. Can you sort of see how some of these different lenses can be used to understand the situation and we're pulling apart the different bits and pieces that might be involved? And as I've gone through and said, these are some options for responding. As you're thinking about conflict that you've dealt with, some of those ideas might start to percolate with you and you could even start to have a bit of a list that you put together as a, a draft plan. I really like that approach of first brainstorming and generating options before making decisions about how to respond. It often leads to a much wider understanding of the situation and therefore a more comprehensive, I think, uh, way of dealing with it. So the next possible type of conflict is structural. This is stuff like organisational hierarchy, meeting structure, how decisions are made, how communication happens. Obviously in this case, there's a probably significant portion of organisational hierarchy structural conflict going on. This matrix management approach again and again leads to this type of conflict. If it's going to work, what it really needs is two individuals that are very committed to working effectively together. And I think, honestly, to some extent, there's a natural fit in terms of their communication style. You might find a very data-focused, analytical, careful, detail-oriented person clashing with a results-oriented, quick decision, you know, the red, fiery red type of personality. And you, what you'll often find is that they need to go through in a much finer level of detail how they're going to work together if that's not going to cause problems. 
So you could think about things like meeting structure with these two staff, maybe if they could meet more frequently or less frequently, or you have different people in the room, so it's not just the two of them. Some of those structural options might solve some of that conflict that's happening. You could look at decisions that are made and who needs approval for what, and maybe there's opportunity to streamline things so both of them don't need to give approval. Perhaps they'd be willing to negotiate around, you know, leave arrangements, that's up to the ops manager, but caseload kind of stuff, given the fact that there's a clinical implication, maybe that then is shifted over to the clinical supervisor so that they're looking at caseload as well as what the client, what the staff actually do with clients and they are not becoming sort of this mutually exclusive set of competing goals. How communication happens, this could be, you know, sort of CCing in a senior manager or something like that. I don't know about you, I, I personally really hate that. I really despise the over CCing culture that some organizations have. This, It is just such a blatant lack of trust that you need to CC your manager when you're communicating somebody else. Unless there's an explicit concern around, I need my manager to know because they'll need to approve it later. And this saves time of me circling back to them. So many organizations just CC their manager into everything and it just creates this sense of pressure and tension. Imagine having a conversation and you've got someone sitting there on the side watching what both of you are saying. Of course, it creates a sense of perceived pressure. Like all of us are programmed not to want to stand out from the herd. You know, it's been historically dangerous through evolution. And so we're hardwired for that situation to come across as particularly pressurizing and, and threatening. And so what often happens as a result is people are more reactive than we would hope for. I think in so many situations that these types of leadership styles of command and control, you know, very directive, top-down leadership backfire, especially in terms of staff engagement and morale. If their work, unfortunately, what often happens is that staff end up burning themselves out and you might have a revolving door of people coming and going because the pressure that's put on them is too much. Uh, my little rant, I wonder what your thoughts are about all of that. Then way to respond to structural conflict is often to change the structure to acknowledge the impact that it's having maybe we could say here something like look to be honest it's not the fault of either of you from where i sit it seems like the fact that you've got two different areas that you're both responsible for and there's no easy way for you to communicate about that maybe that's put you in a position where this was never going to work and so what I'd like to do is to talk with the two of you and find a way to maybe adjust some of that structure and communication so that you can get on with what you need to be focusing on day to day. We would look for options for change and then at least in the short term, just look for options to adapt. If they say something like, yep, no worries, we'll set up a fortnightly meeting to discuss this and this and this, you could say, all right, well, what are you going to do until then? Are there any particular decisions that we need to talk about before we finish the meeting? Or can you just communicate by email for those? So let's figure out those, those expectations very clearly in the short term, especially where there's a high level of conflict. That's going to be something that significantly increases the chance of trust being rebuilt. The next type of conflict is interest conflict. This is basically, I want this and you want this. Like you can see the musical chairs picture on the screen there. So the new manager want to maybe wants to establish their authority and be in charge of something that launches successfully. The clinical supervisor might have young kids at the moment and they want to make sure that they're at the door at 5 p.m. and they're annoyed at the supervisor constantly increasing the scope of this, you know, massive annual meeting or something like that because you, they feel like they're just trying to big note themselves. And when we're dealing with interest conflict, the challenge is that there's often no magic wand that we can wave. There's no quick fix. It's often about talking with the people involved and helping them to decide, well, how assertive do you need to be here? You know, of course, you'd prefer not to have to stay late. Is there some flexibility there, though, for you? If they give you notice and you know when it will be expected and you've got some type of assurance that there would only be a limited number of days that you're required to stay at the office for, then would be would that be something that you'd be willing to accept? So interest conflict, we sort of want to identify it, but then it's really about a conversation of, can you compromise and meet in the middle? Are one of you going to just not give in or is one of you going to just completely give in? And again, you can decide if you're in a leadership role, how assertive or directive you decide to be here. In some situations, I can imagine it would be perfectly suitable just to say to the two staff, how are you going to make this work? In other situations, you could say something like, this is the decision that I've made. 
you know, given the fact that you've been here longer, you'll have first choice of leave. Next time around, though, it'll be a first in best dress system. Sorry, I don't know if you can hear that. It's very rainy and windy here at the moment. So I, I live in Coffs Harbour in uh, Australia, New South Wales. So it's kind of like the far eastern bit of Australia, if you look at Australia on the map, and really bad storms at this time of year, unfortunately. So the way we deal with interest conflict, discuss the situation, focus on future and solutions, develop mutual interests. Like maybe we could say something like, look, I know that it's important for the two of you to make this work, given that you've moved with your family to take this job, or given the fact that you've really invested so much time over the years to improving these programs. And then as much as possible, clarify those expectations, especially when I'm doing workplace mediation. A lot of the time we talk about trust. And trust is a really difficult thing to rebuild after there's been a breach of trust, some type of an incident that's happened. And I often say to particularly senior managers and directors, look, there's no quick fix. There's no magic wand. There's no button that you can push. It's very difficult for any person to just decide to trust someone if we look at it honestly. And if you ask someone to trust you, what are you actually asking for? For them to feel trusting, to believe you? It's like faith. I think what we're often talking about when we ask someone to trust us is to give us the benefit of the doubt, to let us prove ourselves, to give us another chance. But where we think about trust developing between two staff in the context of workplace conflict, one of the real foundational elements for that to start to improve is extremely clear expectations that are then followed through with. Often that is what's needed then for trust to be rebuilt because if I know what you're going to do and then you follow through and do it, then I start to trust you. I believe, I have faith that you're going to be consistent and live up to your word and do what you've promised me that you're going to do. And if those expectations aren't clear, what happens is that it's a recipe for trust to be eroded because I see your action and I think, well, what's your problem? And because we never actually talked about whether or not that was something that's acceptable, I'm going to assume that it wasn't. And then that resentment starts to build as a result. The final type of conflict is values conflict. This is stuff like, well, it might be like big values, like environmental sustainability or something like that. And you might have conflict within the organization because someone thinks we should invest in this green product. Someone else thinks, you know, we should maximize profits and this would let us help more people or something like that. And you've got this set of competing values to manage. But in a lot of cases, it's stuff like communication style, like, um, one person might feel like it's really good to be transparent. You know, I'm a straight shooter. I call it how I see it. You always know where you stand with me. And then someone else on the team might just think, I just want to go to work and do my job. I don't want the drama. I don't want the headaches. I don't need to say every thought that comes into my head. And if you put these two people together in a team, there's an increased chance of conflict developing just because of those different sets of values. It's really difficult to change that because people have these definitions like polite or professional or respectful or whatever it is, and you're probably not going to change that in the short term. It's usually about acknowledging, validating, you know, I, I'm aware that both of you have got very different communication styles. I just want to touch base with the two of you because I've noticed that there's you know, been some challenges that you'd needed to overcome in your communication. And I'd like to organize a meeting to talk through what could be tweaked or what might be needed moving forward to make sure that you don't run into any issues in your working relationship. So this is a different set of values that you got. How are you going to make this work? Acknowledge both perspectives, respectfully observe differences in this mutual and neutral way. Look, you've got different ideas about the best way to go here. It's like, that's fine. That's okay. That's normal. It's not such a catastrophe. You hate each other and you think the other person's completely wrong. Okay. I'm not actually going to add any judgment or view about that. It's like, I can, I can understand both of your perspectives. What is needed then in terms of communicating with one another? How are you going to avoid then the chance of misunderstandings developing? Given the fact that you'd prefer to just talk things through on the spot and it causes you a lot of stress when things are bottled up and not dealt with, what would give you some assurance that it's not going to slip off the radar? Would it be organizing a meeting or having a joint file that you can keep track of uh, topics for a future meeting agenda? Like, how are you going to figure this out? And as much as possible, you can probably tell from my leadership style, I really like using a coaching approach here. How are you going to make this work? If you're a collaborative, supportive leader, you often use language like, how are we going to figure this out? I wanted to talk about how we can manage this. 
I don't. I just say, look, how are the two of you going to figure this out? This is going to be a tough one. I'd love to hear your thoughts because I'm not going to be there in every meeting that you have. I certainly don't want you to CC me into every email that you've got. So figure it out. <laughs> but I want them to tell me how they're going to figure it out because I know that the higher level of detail that they've got in that plan, the higher likelihood that they're actually going to follow through with it. So not surprisingly, clarify those expectations moving forward. So just have a pause and think about what are your main takeaways for the session, those different types of conflict, data conflict, structural conflict, values conflict, interest conflict, relationship conflict. What are you dealing with at the moment in your workplace and what do you think might work? And if you've been focusing on one of the areas like data conflict, I keep telling staff not to use their phone. I keep telling staff that they need to remember to do this. Well, then which of the other four types of conflict do you think might also be happening? Is it relationship? Are the staff feeling a bit resentful about all the change that they've had to deal with recently? Is it uh, interest maybe? They're very busy and feel like they're overworked at the moment and this is an extra thing that management's asking them to do. If you can sort of peel the onion and get to the heart of what's going on, it often gives you so much more information then to understand the situation and therefore to be more effective in responding to it. So thank you so much for watching. I'd, I'd love to know what you thought about this particular um, approach to delivering this kind of training. Um, if you've got a question about anything that I've covered, please let it leave it below and I'd be happy to respond to you personally. And if you've got an idea for a future video, a different case study or a different situation, or you'd like me to talk through de-escalation skills or something like that, please let me know. I'm really happy to take a flexible approach. I'd like this to be a pretty engaging, interactive type of channel. And for my part, I'm really willing to do my best to make sure that I'm delivering actually useful resources. I don't know about you. I think a lot of the stuff on YouTube, it's hit and miss. But in stuff like workplace conflict, I think it's just so generic. Like, make sure that you're using respectful language. It's like, well, that's great. I mean, that's kind of obvious. But what do we say? <laughs> and that's where I come in. I think I'd like to give examples of phrases and questions and stuff. And of course, if each of us have a different style, a lot of this, there's cultural nuance to it. But you can sort of see the way that I think about the situations and then apply that to your own context. And even if you have a different style and you decide to go about things a little bit differently, certainly my hope is that these sessions are still helpful for you. Thanks so much for watching. Bye for now.